What are the different fuels that we use to make electricity? In America, 50% of the electricity comes from coal, 20% comes from natural gas, 20% from nuclear, and about six or seven percent from hydro, yeah. and then one or two percent from sun and wind. Huh. Unfortunately, solar and wind are rounding errors today huh. when it comes to the total composition of how we produce electricity. Is 50 percent coal, is that our capacity or what we actually use every year? Well, the, the coal runs almost 24-7. It, that is one of our base loads, okay. that and nuclear. So when you say base load, what does that mean? It means that is the resource that is running all the time, even when we're using a minimum amount. The units that will not run all the time are going to be the gas plants and the wind and the sun. And why do we pick coal and nuclear to run all the time? I think a couple of things. One, historically, coal has been really cheap. Okay. So it makes sense to run the cheapest commodity the most time. Secondly, once you've got a coal plant up and running, they're not really designed to turn down. Okay. They're designed to run flat out. That's the way they work the best. That's the same with a nuclear plant. They're designed to turn on and run. Right. And that's what they do. Okay. Now, a gas plant is a lot easier. You can turn it up, you can bring it back down with relative ease. And that's the kind of the role that it plays. Oh, and it, it's just more flexible that way? Is it part of the design? It is more flexible. Plus, just the nature of natural gas gives you the ability to add more to it quickly, get the water up hotter, sure. bring on another unit. Many of the natural gas plants are a, sec a series of small units put next to each other. Right. So you could be running two of them and then add two more fairly uh, quickly and right. bring the full capacity of that plant up. Tell me how the electric grid works. Is it connected everywhere in the U.S.? They're not connected. And this is really interesting because in America, we have three electric grids. We have the eastern grid, which is mainly the Midwest states and everything to the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. We have the western grid, which is sort of going from the Rocky Mountains west to the Pacific. And then we have the grid in Texas, which is not interconnected with the other two. And, and one of the interesting debates that's going on around the country is, should the grids be interconnected? Would it make sense for them to be interconnected? Well, I think a lot of it revolves around how do we maximize our renewable potential? Because if the middle part of the country is where most of the wind is, mm -hmm. and really from the panhandle of Texas up to the Canadian border are some of the best wind resources in North America. But not a lot of people live there. So we got to figure out how to move that energy either to Los Angeles or to the East Coast. Well, if you're going to move it to Los Angeles, you're going from one grid to another grid. So they're not interconnected today. That would be an issue. What's kind of the state of the, of the transmission grid today in the country? Well, it's not very robust. What has happened over time is grids have built out around urban areas. Because back in the day, 100 years ago, when we began to electrify, primarily you had a generation resource close to where people lived. So you'd have a coal or a gas plant close to where people live, and then you didn't have to string much wire. And we sort of expanded out from that. Now, with renewables, since we know where the wind is, and for the, and for the most part, the sun is located in areas where people don't live too, we're going to have to build a lot of long-haul transmission. And as a country, we have not made that decision. We've made that decision here in Texas, and we're doing that. You say we've made that decision. What are we doing here in Texas? We have a lot of wind. We do. We do. We have some of the best wind resources around. And so we went out and surveyed West Texas in the panel. We found the best wind areas. And then we came up with a plan to build transmission out to those areas, which are remote in a long way, and deliver it back in to Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston. Okay. That plan is 2,300 miles of high capacity transmission. It's about $5 billion. And we're going to have it completed by the end of 2013. It's the biggest renewable energy infrastructure project maybe in the history of America. And who pays for that? In Texas, we made a decision 
back in 1999 that we were going to share the cost of transmission and place it on every consumer of electricity. Which is everybody. Everybody, yeah. based upon their consumption. So if you consume a little bit, you pay a little bit. If you consume a lot, you pay a lot. We estimate that when we get it all built out and the utilities start putting in rates, it'll be about $4 a month for the average customer in Texas. Is this something that uh, the federal government's looking into? Is, it, is Texas model for that exportable to the nation? We are hoping to create 18 to 19,000 megawatts of wind and get to 20 to 25 percent of our electricity coming from wind. If the country wanted to do that, they ought to do at least 10 times that amount. I wish the country would really look at what we're doing and make a commitment to string in some wire from the middle part of the country to the west and the east, mm -hmm. because that is going to be required if we're serious about wind renewables. Could they just follow the interstate highway system with these big power transmission lines? It's possible. We're looking at that here for a couple of the long run lines that we're contemplating going from San Antonio out to West Texas. Can we go down I-10? Could we go up I-35? It's possible. You got to see how much right of way yeah. is available. And I don't know if the Department of Transportation will allow us to put the poles in the median because right. we got to service them. Sure. What happens if an 18 wheeler wrecks and runs into sure. the poles and they fall down on people and they get electrocuted. So there are some issues, but taking advantage of a place mm -hmm. that already has infrastructure is a good idea. So, so this transmission grid is critical. What is it gonna take to make it work together? It sounds like there's more intermittent, there's base load. The challenge is the wind tends to blow at night and in the early morning. We tend to consume most of our electricity in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah. The wind blows more in the spring and fall. We consume most of our electricity right. in the middle of summer. When the wind stops blowing, we have to bring up either gas units or some other units to keep the grid stable mm -hmm. and, and meet the demand. So if we get storage, which has kind of been the holy grail of electricity. Electricity storage. Yes. Okay. And most people don't know Today, we can't store electricity. So we don't have a battery that's any good? <laughs> well, we have some small batteries. You know, yeah. you have the battery in your laptop. We're starting to see batteries in cars. But think about this. We put a storage technology next to a wind farm. Mm -hmm. As the wind's blowing, we're putting power into the technology, whether it's a battery or underground pump storage. And when the wind stops blowing, we release it put it on the grid. Right. Suddenly, that variable resource is no longer variable. So if we could store it when it's blowing, release it when it's not, then suddenly we smooth everything out. We're getting smarter. Okay. The, the grid is getting smarter and our people are getting smarter. One of the interesting things that's gonna start happening though is we're gonna empower the customer with either a smart meter or some other mechanism so the customer can turn down their demand to make up for the falling wind. In the old days, it was customer did nothing but consume. Generator supplied power, right. and there was no back and forth right. between the two of them. We want to change that so it's a little bit more dynamic now. So what is a smart meter? Let's say you have an LED readout by the kitchen sink, and it tells you instantaneously how much you're consuming, what it's costing you, how much you have uh, incurred for that month, what your bill is likely to be at the end of the month if you continue on your, on your way. <laughs> consumption journey. Your consumption <laughs> journey. And, and so you begin to have a feedback loop to say, hey, kids, yeah. turn some stuff off. Right. Or we'll do the laundry at 10 o'clock at night. Turn up the air conditioner. Turn the air conditioner yeah. up a couple of degrees. Get off yeah. the computer. Yeah. So I'm, I'm basically, I'm like I went with gasoline. I have to watch the pennies churn there. So I'm, I get, actually get to see the amount of money I'm spending on electricity in my home now. So this is going to put that 
price to consumption it's reality like, right it's in like my lap. <laughs> every other product that we consume. Sure. Food, gasoline, it, you would, how often do you go to a restaurant and ask the waiter, don't tell me what it costs, just <laughs> bring me out the yeah. steak, right? right? But that's the way we've always consumed electricity. Yeah. So it may cost me a little bit, but I save it pretty quickly and more. All of the pilot projects that have been run around the country show when a customer gets a smart meter, they reduce their consumption between 10 and 20 percent. That's amazing. Finally, it's they've good got for the everything. information. It's good for everything. It's good for the environment. Yeah. It's good for prices. We're putting out less carbon. We're using less of our natural resource. So natural gas is increasing in the U.S. How is that going to impact the whole uh, relationship to electricity? You know, one of the things I, I never really realized is how clean natural gas is. You know, it's half the carbon, mm -hmm. and it's a fraction of all the other stuff. It's a fraction of the SO2, a fraction of the NOx. There's no mercury at all. Mm -hmm. So when we think about it, yes, it's still a fossil fuel, but it, it's actually very clean, yeah. right? And we have a lot of it. Yeah. Two years ago, people were worried that we might be running out of natural gas. Yeah. And if that was the case, we were going to have to import it like we do oil mm -hmm. from countries with a lot of it. Suddenly, with this technology that has been really discovered and revolutionized here in our state, with horizontal drilling and fracturing of these shale layers, we think we've got a hundred hundreds of years of reliable natural gas. It has completely changed the landscape. So it's a domestic resource. We have a lot of it. It's really, I think it's pretty kind on the generation plants. In other words, I think you can burn it and it doesn't take a lot of wear and tear mm -hmm. on your plant. And you have the ability to ramp your plant mm -hmm. up and down to respond to renewable energy like wind or sun. Now, there seems to be developing a lot of concern about pollution emissions associated with drilling. Hmm. So when you put all these drilling rigs in the middle of an urban area like Fort Worth, which sits on top of the Barnett Shale, they're going to emit some gases, and so there's some issues there. There's also people who are afraid that drilling through the water table to reach the natural gas shale could cause some contamination of the water table. I don't think it's ever happened, but there's some people who are concerned about it. Yeah. Electric cars, you see those coming? Is that part of the future? I think the technology is going to figure out how to make this work. One of the biggest obstacles now is people have range anxiety. Yeah. They're afraid they're going to run out of power. So one of the utilities down in Houston is trying to work with some retailers. Maybe it's our favorite coffee shop. Right? Mm -hmm. to put a recharging facility out in front of the coffee shop. Now, that's mainly psychological because you're, you're probably not going to run out of juice every day. But knowing that that infrastructure is there frees your mind up to go sure. ahead and drive around. Sure. And, and so we could see the private sector really jump in with some creative solutions. And I'm not suggesting that we're going to get off of gasoline in the next five to ten years. Okay. You know, this is a... How long? I mean, what's this vision? Is I, you it know, a, 2050. Is it, yeah. I think it's 40 years. Okay. And, and even then, I think that we'll still have gasoline vehicles or diesel. But one of the nice things about it is the electric vehicle puts pressure on the internal combustion engine to get more and more efficient, yeah. right? So here's my vision of the future. Wind generated out in West Texas in the Panhandle. Electricity gets on these long transmission lines that we're building delivered to your home where you have a smart meter. And you plug in your electric vehicle when you get home from work. And your meter searches for the time when the price is the lowest and it's the greenest. Yeah. So suddenly the meter says... While you're asleep. <laughs> 11.30 at night, meter says, charge up car, right? Yeah. So it charges up. It's green and it's cheap. You drive it the next day. Ideally, you get to work. You plug it back in. The grid says, okay, Scott's car's got some extra capacity in it. In the middle of the afternoon, draw some of it in to stabilize the system. Hmm. Pays you for doing that because now you're a generation resource. Doesn't take enough away so you can't drive home. Sure. Right? 
You get in your car, you've made a little money during the day, you've yeah. helped to keep the grid reliable, yeah. you go back home and it starts over. America has a lot of coal. You know, we're, we're the Saudi Arabia of coal. Yeah. If you've ever been to the Powder River Basin area in Wyoming, it's hundreds and hundreds of feet of coal. Yeah. It's easy to get to. You take a big bulldozer up, put it in a truck, and put it on a train, and deliver it to the power plant. So it's, it's available and it's inexpensive. That's the pro of coal. The downside is it takes a lot of coal to make an equivalent amount of electricity. And it has a lot of carbon, and it, it releases other elements into the atmosphere that are harmful. The new coal plants that we have in Texas, and we've opened two or three of them lately, capture almost everything. The bag houses and the scrubbers and the filters grab the NOx, the SO2, they grab the mercury, mm -hmm. the particulate matter, almost, they get almost all of it, mm -hmm. except the CO2. They don't get the carbon. And if we're going to do something about carbon as a nation, if you believe that that is a worthy objective, mm -hmm. then those plants are going to have to be retrofitted with some kind of technology. What does the capture of carbon do to the price of coal and electricity that comes from coal? It would, it would certainly make the price go up because the equipment that you'd have to put on the side of the coal plant is a, what we call a parasitic load. Mm. It takes a lot of energy away from the plant to capture the carbon. It, so the economics of it really become much worse right. for the coal plant, which means they have to raise their prices. Are we talking 10, 20, or 30, 40, 50 percent? It, it, it's more? all going to be dependent upon how high the price of carbon sure. is, because you could, under some of the ideas in Washington, not put these additional features on your plant and buy a carbon credit and just keep sending the carbon up. Right. Or you could retro retrofit your plant, sell your carbon credits, and make money that way. Sure. Nuclear. Nuclear is, the, the pros of nuclear are that it takes a very small amount of uranium to make a whole bunch of electricity. It's a staggering difference. Yeah. So we can make a lot of electricity with a little amount. And we have uranium. We have it here in Texas. Right? It's relatively easy to find. Once you build the plants, they're very inexpensive to operate. So the price of that energy is very cheap. Mm -hmm. The negatives are the price of building a nuclear power plant is 10 to $13 billion. It's more than the capitalization of many of the companies that want to build the plants. Right. The other con is we have not resolved the storage issue in America. We recently decided, the Congress decided, I think, inappropriately, to shut down Yucca Mountain, yeah. which is where we were going to put all this stuff. And now we don't have a facility, and we're storing the spent material on site. We can do that for a while, but we can't do that forever. How about solar? Well, again, uh, one of the <clears throat> pros of having distributed solar, uh, it gives you the ability to reduce the amount of power you're taking off the grid. But the sun doesn't always shine, and so I can't go off the grid. I still have to be relying upon the utility to provide me. The price is still high. For my solar panel array, it costs $25,000. Austin Energy paid half of it. I paid half of it. So I paid $12,500. Mm -hmm. I'm only saving about $20 a month. So if you do the math on that, that's, that's a lot of years. That's a 40 year Chairman. payback. And so what has to happen? The price of the panels have to come down. The efficiency of the panels has to get better so I can save more mm -hmm. every month. And then we have to figure out a way, maybe we, we roll it into your home mortgage. I'm more encouraged about some of the roofing materials mm. that might have the technology embedded in it. So you get a brand new roof on your house, every shingle has solar technology in it, and suddenly your entire home is a solar array. Yeah. And instead of saving only $20 a month, you're not paying anything. That's, I think, where the technology will go, but it's not there yet. As an individual, 
what can I do to continue to be more efficient? Well, there is a school of thought that we can keep the lights on going forward just through advances in energy efficiency. In other words, we don't need to build any more power plants. We are just not efficient enough. Mm -hmm. And I think there are some improvements to be done there. I mean, whether it's a, a different light bulb, more insulation, better windows, all of those things that help us consume less, they're great. And industry has done that for years. And so how do we bring that into small business and into homes? And we're trying to do that here in our state. At some point, we grab all the low-hanging fruit, right? We've already insulated, we put the windows in, and so then it becomes, I think, a little bit more challenging to do that because there's probably a baseline of consumption that's gonna be hard to get below. Right. What we're gonna try to do here in Texas is not reduce the total demand, but reduce the increase in the demand. So that's a little bit easier to accomplish. We know that more people are gonna move here. The demographer says we're gonna have 40 million people mm. by 2040. 50 million people by 2050 will be the most <laughs> populous state in the union. So just because of that, we're gonna need more power. If we can reduce the slope of that increasing line by 20, 30, or 50%, that's gonna make a huge difference, and that's what we're focused on.